You're listening to episode 173 of the Writing Life podcast from the National Centre for Writing, a weekly podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Simon Jones. And I'm Steph McKenna. And it is the 19th of November 2021 here in Norwich. How are you, Steph? I'm not bad, thank you. I'm hanging out in Dragon Hall today. It's very nice. How are you? I'm good. We have a, an exciting week coming up next week, don't we, with the East Anglian Book Awards announcement. Yes, we do. So Thursday, the 25th of November is the big day at 6.30pm. You can join us on YouTube for free and we will be revealing the winner of the Book of the Year Award for this year's East Anglian Book Awards, which celebrate the very best in writing and publishing within the region. So yes, very much looking forward to that. And you've been having a great time, Simon, uh, meeting all of the category winners, putting together the event. Yeah, it's going to be a a lovely evening. Peggy has had conversations with each of the winners, uh, talking about their books and their processes and how they got to the point of having books that have won East Anglian Book Awards awards. Also in other news, we have a whole new load of creative writing online courses, which are now up on the website and available for booking. We actually have an early bird discount on at the moment, which I think lasts through to the end of the month. So if you're interested, do get in there nice and quick. So we're running 12-week courses in historical fiction, creative nonfiction, and fiction, and a longer six-month course for writing poetry next steps. And they all begin at the end of January. And as Simon says, if you book your place now, you can take advantage of our early bird rate, which runs until the end of November. Yeah, so if you're looking to jump straight into doing some writing in 2022, that's a really good way to do it. Talking of doing lots of writing, we're smack in the middle of NaNoWriMo at the moment. So if any of you listening are involved in that and hastily trying to get to your 50,000 word limit, do check out our Discord community. We have a whole bunch of people in there taking part and sharing word counts and just generally giving each other advice and support to try and get through the month. So if you're doing that, good luck. On the show today, we have Derek Barreto joining us to talk to Rebecca Dewald about is Visible Communities Residency, which took place earlier in the year. These were residencies that were actually able to take place at Dragon Hall in our cottage, which has been a fairly rare occurrence over the last 18 months due to various pandemic-related restrictions. In the conversation, Derek talks about his first encounters with learning new languages back at school and how he then forged a path into literary translation. Yeah, and it's always such a joy to have Rebecca leading the interviews on the podcast. She is always so enthusiastic. We're very lucky to have her as part of the NCW team. Okay, so let's hand over to Rebecca and Derek, talking earlier this year. So thanks so much, Derek, for joining us today to talk about your um, literary translation career and what you've been working on um, while at the cottage at Norwich at your residency. Um, I just wanted to jump straight in and just ask you about who you are, what you do, what your background is, and how you got into translation more generally, and literary translation more specifically. My name's Derek Barreto, and I'm the Visual Communities Resident Translator. My background is that languages featured prominently in my educational background from an early age. Um, I started studying Latin at the age of 10 and Greek at the age of 13. I started studying Portuguese actually quite late on in 1988 when our family emigrated to Portugal. Really enjoyed the the language. I, I think it helped a lot that my my Latin background and the, even the Greek background helped with, with um, deciphering certain words in Portuguese. And I, I had to I had to learn Portuguese very quickly from scratch because we'd moved to a new country. Dad didn't speak the language. Mum didn't speak the language. Although we are originally from a Portuguese, an ex-Portuguese colony, which is Goa. And so, yeah, so thrown in at the deep end, studied there. And thanks to my father, he, he, he paid for me to do an intensive course. And then I got selected to go on the Portuguese for foreigners course at Cidade Universitaria. And I had great teachers, both them, both the, the first teacher and the teacher at Cidade Universitaria were absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, as 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 has been mentioned on, on the on the web, website, I think with NCW website. Um, yeah, so that's my back my, my initial background in in the interest in Portuguese and uh, Madrigal de Fria, which is the first book that I'm attempting to trans my attempting to pitch it once I've translated it as well, is uh, a poetry anthology by 
um, Laura De Silva, and I came across her book quite by accident when I was in Collindale Library, which is not too far from Hendon, where I live in northwest London. And um, I read the book and read the poems and was struck by their simplicity and yet their an amazing range of emotions. Um, now, people might say, oh, well, you know, of course, you're a man. How, how would you know the emotions that a woman feels? But the way that Laura brings these emotions to the surface in a poem and yet can still conceal some of the po- some of the undercurrents of the emotions is something which is probably, I would say, not peculiar to Portuguese, but it's something which is really, I mean, Portugal for a long, long time, and and, and even in Nora de Silva's day, was under the dictatorship of Salazar. And people, after Portugal opened up, people have still had, the older people have still had, still had this kind of... Um, tension between people who are possibly supporting Salazar and people who are not. And, and although the minority of people were supporting Salazar by, by the time he was deposed. And so the Portuguese people are, I would say, different from the English people. Although they're very warm people, they they can be reserved in terms of ex- expressing emotion sometimes. And this is something which Laura is is able to focus on in such a way that she can portray her emotions very well at the same at the same time showing that kind of um a, a kind of feeling w- in, in which she's um not revealing everything but hinting to us what the what she's revealing so it, it's i meant i mentioned later on in my notes um rebecca that it's it's l- like looking at two sides of a coin the face of the coin is very, very pretty, and her poetry is very pretty, simple, easy to translate in that respect. But the obverse of the coin is that there's an undercurrent underneath saying, you know, where, where the woman is saying to to, to the reader, um, well, it's not always an easy journey knowing a man in a relationship, and it, it, can, it can go from immense highs to lows. But the beauty of her poetry is that it doesn't, it, it's not, it's not like un- an undulating hills. There's immense ups and immense downs. It- it's very carefully reflected upon, and and it draws you in. It draws you in so well. Yeah. So Laura da Silva is a contemporary poet. Is that That's correct? right. Yeah. 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 Um, because I'm just trying to get like the sort of timeline a little bit as well yeah. in terms of in terms of both you and and the poet and kind of like yeah. how because I'm fascinated by these things. I don't know if like you, like in, in translation theory, Walter Benjamin talks about the the idea that like maybe there's a perfect time for like a work to be translated to find its translator. So it doesn't always have to be at the time that it's written, that it's then has to be translated. But like at some point in the future, maybe the perfect translator will come along as well. Yes. Um, so I was trying, trying to work out in terms of like your own experience of of moving to Portugal, how old were you when you moved to Portugal? Um, I, I, as, I, as I mentioned, um, Rebecca, I came quite late to, to learning yeah. Portuguese. I, I think I, I would have been um, t- twenty nine years old. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I, I'd really, I'd enjoyed translating at school. I'd enjoyed translating Latin and Greek, and done well in my A levels. Managed to go to a good university as well, and I kind of um, always that flair for languages was there. Mm-hmm. And it comes goes back generations to my mother, my my grandfather, who I never met, but apparently was wonderf- wonderfully um, gifted with idioms and local dialects on the on the railways in India. As you know, there's some multiple la- languages and dialects in mm-hmm. India, and he was a station master in the time of the Raj, and he had to deal with various people all the way from people who were carrying the luggage of of people off the train to drivers, guards. Um, assistant station master. So he was he was a man who was in charge of a number of people, but was so well versed in their own in their cultures and in their dialects that he could talk to anyone. And he he did. I, I'm so sad that I never met him. Although I do have a picture of a sunflower which he sketched. And, and strangely enough, last year I, I planted a sunflower in the garden. And it bloomed and grew seven seven little fl- flowers. Yeah. With, uh, yeah, but yeah. To come back to, to what we were saying uh, about translation, so I, I came to Portugal in when I was twenty eight years old, mm-hmm. and I studied there. And um, and right from the get go of studying, I, I got interested in Portuguese literature. I mean, obviously, 
initially your, your teachers will say, oh, you got to read Esther de Queros or you got to read Jose Saramago. Mm-hmm. But of course, I, I couldn't initially do that. Mm-hmm. But what, what, in 1989, when I went to Sudan University area for a six month course, um, my teacher said to me, challenged me to, to read Memorial de Convento by Jose Saramago, mm-hmm. which, as you know, is an immensely long book. Mm-hmm. very, very complicated Portuguese and t- uh, similar to Gabriel Ga- Garcia Marquez's dream sequencing of sort of, sort of uh, mm. um, so vocabulary. you get lost in terms of where you are in terms of time. Yes, as yeah. well, and immensely yeah. long sentences, as, as you, I'm sure you've seen in Spanish as well, mm. um, Rebecca. Yeah. But no, so it took me, because obviously because I was still working at the time when I brought the book back to England, because I left Portugal after four years being there mm. to come back and do TEFL teaching. And I was reading Memorial. It took me, I think, about 10 years to finish Memorial de Convento. But I was determined to read it without reading an English translation. And I think that helped me to to really appreciate the richness and the beauty of Portuguese language. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, although I am a practicing Catholic, Rebecca, I would say that Some people would say to me, why are you reading a book like that, which is so anti-Catholic and so (laughs) anti the priesthood, etc.? And I said, well, because it's good literature and he's won the Nobel Prize, for God's sake. You know, I'm not I'm not going to decry that. I'm I'm not going to say he's an anti-Catholic or whatever. All I liked about the book, that it's a marvellous literature, it's well written and it's a marvellous, marvellous story as well. Mm -hmm. so although it took me 10 years to read the book fully, uh, partly because I was also working at the time and didn't have the time to, to look in my dictionary every, every other, every 10 minutes or so. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, of course, I, I, I would never attempt to translate it, um, that a book like that. It, and it has been translated, of course, by, uh, by people. So I was going to ask that because if you spend so much time with the book and like I was kind of, I'm intrigued by like your journey then of like going into language teaching, but also yeah. is there part of you that thinks I've spent so much intense time with this book and I'm really learning it inside out. Were you translating little bits of it? Were you already thinking I want to be translated? That would be, that's how I bring Portuguese literature to English. Yeah. Obviously while, while I was reading the book, um, I was um, translating it in my mind and also on, not on paper so much, but making little notes in, in the book, uh, so various vocabularies and things. And there are certain words in, in Memoir of the Convento which you just won't find in a dictionary, mm. you know, because it, some of them, are, the words are so unusual. Um, so it was, that was good for me, trying to find out what the word meant by fitting it into the context. And and I'd been used to, from a young age, tr- translating Latin and Greek, so I'd been used to... Mm. We, we had something as, at school, Rebecca, in, in, in my time, in my school days, where you had to translate from Latin or Greek without seeing the vocabulary. So mm. it's called unseen translation. You may have heard of that, obviously, mm. Rebecca. So I kind of, um, I, I set myself the task of not looking at the dictionary as much as I possibly could. Of course, that's, that's almost, almost impossible <laughs> with mm. just a small go. But, uh, and then I supplemented that with reading um, people who are easier on on uh, vocabulary wise, such as Sophia de Mello, Brian Anderson, Esther de Queros, I read for for historic, slightly historical reasons. So his, his contos are absolutely brilliant, and they're short stories, so you can grasp what the story is all about very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, yeah, so I, I continued my interest in Portuguese literature, and I suppose one of the driving factors for me, Rebecca, of why I wanted to become a literary translator is that one of my teachers, Portuguese teachers, my first Portuguese, well, my second proper Portuguese teacher, were who I did an intensive course with of one month um, Portuguese and gave me a great grounding in the basics of grammar, etc. She is also an author and a prize-winning author, Rebecca. So mm. she's won the fiction prize for Almada, which is Almada is the other side of the river from Lisbon, as you know. And um, she's, basically, she's, written books and a number of her books have won prizes in Portugal, not internationally. 
So she promised me, I think from I think from about five or maybe six years ago, that she'd give me faithfully give me a novel of hers. But I'm still waiting for the promise to be delivered. Partly because she's so busy, Rebecca. She has a, a teenage son, and she has she's a, she's now a director of um, the Museum National of the of Contemporary Art in in Lisbon. So she's very 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 busy. Um, I, I keep on saying to her, I'll buy the book, I'll buy the book. And she keeps on saying to me, no, I'm going to give it to you. It's a gift for you, Derek. So, so I'm waiting. But and if it, if, if it comes to it, I will, of course, it's difficult to find Portuguese tran, um, books mm. it, it, in the original. Mm. Uh, and some of her books go back a few years. Um, but no, so, so that is my dream to translate her one day with her permission. And uh, <laughs> it may be easier, for, I think, to get her permission than it may to get to Lara de Silva's permission because I'm still working <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that. Um, the waiting game lo- translators listening to this will probably know about this. I think there's there's myriad stories of translators being really eager to translate a work and taking years and years to pitch it. Yes, and, to come to fruition, like, yeah. For, somebody to, for the publishers to finally realise what an amazing work of literature yes. translators have found in this foreign language that they can't yet read. So I think we've all got kind of like one one on the shelf where we're like, one day, one day somebody will realise what great book yeah. is. I mean, I mentioned to my mentor, Mina, Mina Kandasami yesterday and Rebecca, that I do feel that translating books in translation are more and more coming into mm. prominence, and in particular, people like Daniel Hahn and you know uh, Rahul Berry, you know, mm. publicising things, and yourself as well, of course. Mm. Okay. Um, and um, what I one of the things I like about Waterstones, which um, as a bookshop, is that they have quite often published bilingual editions of. Mm either novels or short stories, or in the case of poetry. Uh, I, within the last three years, I, I, I've been reading two books of bilingual editions of poetry, both in Spanish, one of um, Neruda, which I bought recently, 20 Collected Love Poems, and and and, and, and also um, uh, Lorca, um, a, 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 a larger anthology of his. And both of these were bilingual editions with the Spanish on one side and the English on the other side. And I also purchased, uh, I am I'm also, as I mentioned on the NCW website, interested in French um, mm. literature. My French isn't brilliant. I didn't do it at A level, like, although I got a, an A in O level. I had a wonderful teacher at school. And, I, and unfortunately, we had to choose at a young age between doing Latin and Greek or French and Spanish. So mm. because I was better at Latin and Greek, I chose Latin and Greek at that uh, from a very young age, at the age of 13, mm. Rebecca. Mm. So... But um, no, so I've been reading French, and I I do still recall my my first French teacher. He he was um he was a priest, uh, Father Dubois, his name was, but he was not your actual normal priest in terms of preaching or giving sermons about about mm-hmm. French. He would introduce us to uh, Simenon and um, right. Maupassant mm-hmm. and a lot of great French writers. So. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I enjoyed my French O level, really did enjoy it. And I continue to read French a little bit, even while I was at uni. So so this bilingual edition, I can't remember what, who, who wrote it now, or even all the authors in it, but the authors are all contemporary French authors. So, you know, it's keeping me up to date with, with, with my, yeah. just my French, which is slightly rusty, but, you know, I do have an interest in reading Francophone literature. So, you know. I'm sure you would say as well this, uh, Rebecca, it's it's always nice to have more than one language because, Mm. you know, they feed into each other and they balance each other off. And it's been my great regret that I never studied Spanish because, that you know, to know Spanish and Portuguese, that would be a duality Mm. of languages which I could use. And uh, there's still course, time. There's still of time. Of course, it's, it's still time. And I've, I've got my my Spanish books and my Spanish um, <laughs> um, videos and audios yeah. and things to look at. But uh, I suppose I have been focusing more and more on Portuguese. But um, yeah. but yeah. Um, no, I, there, as you said, there is still time. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. I also hope that teachers are listening to this podcast because um, I think they're getting a lot of praise and they, they like it's a, you're a great example of like what teachers can instill in somebody like really the passion for the for the language and for the literature and for the culture just by like you know just the way they approach it as well um 
And I was also, you also mentioned Mina, Mina Kandasam AM. And I was wondering whether we can talk a little bit about what you're doing at the cottage at the moment. So, um, so you're um, one of our translators in residence at the moment. You're spending one week at the cottage at, in Norwich, but you're also working with a mentor with Mina. Do you want to say a little bit of, like what life in the cottage is like? You mentioned it's like nice to, to a gurgling river and like what, um, what the mentorship includes and what you do yeah. there. Well, the, as I mentioned um, earlier, Rebecca, the cottage is in a very nice setting right by the river, not far from the city centre, with lovely walks everywhere we go. Swans on the river who I can feed in the morning before before I start off my translating. And it's very a very, very conducive setting to writing, writing and translating. So I, I know that, that the cottage is well stocked with books and poetry books and books in translation. And uh, it's very a very... Very, very nice. I've also been lucky enough to have the cottage to myself because there's two bedrooms. So I've I, there's no, I've been on my own, so I've really had the run of the place, really. And Mina, with Mina and Rebecca, I had my first Zoom session with her yesterday, yesterday morning. And the second one's not set scheduled until another three months. Mm -hmm. So we had to cover a lot of ground very quickly. But I found Mina immensely practical and motivational in, in what she says and she's she gets cut straight to the quick if you know what i mean and I, I tend to be uh, you know she, she says derek you, you're not in literary translation to be friendly you know you're there to get your translation done you've got to get it done and you've got to find ways to do it and she's suggesting ways and how to go into it and you know suggesting that i put my poems in translations in various poetry pamphlets don't don't just put all my eggs in one basket and say oh I've got to translate Madrigada Freer. There may be other opportunities which come up while I'm doing that or whatever. Um, so Mina has been very inspirational. I knew she would be because I, I, as you may remember Rebecca Anam Zafar who was prior to me at here. I'd, I'd been in contact with Anam via LinkedIn and, and asked a few questions about what. Um, what I would be facing. And Anna said, Derek, just don't worry. Mina is lovely. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, 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 I was prepared to be prepared for somebody who's very, very helpful. And she has been so helpful. We only had an hour together yesterday, but uh, we had, we made so many notes. But then, then again, also, um, Rebecca, I did have the opportunity to meet a, a Norwich-based translator who also does French and Italian and German. Howard Curtis, do you know yeah. Howard? Yeah. He's a, he's a lovely man and he also uh, immensely experienced in translation. So I, I, I spent a good two hours in a cafe with him. They're just talking, talking translation. And <laughs> yeah, and so... I'm always fascinated by that when whenever I meet translators, a group of translators, like for example, yeah. the BCLT summer school, I remember going to the summer school yeah. and um, all translators saying, oh, please don't be offended. I'm just really introverted because I'm a translator and I don't really you know kind of keep to myself and then the first evening like the last people chatting is always the translators because finally yes. they found their people and then they talk yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it doesn't I'm surprise not... me they spend two hours chatting to hours <laughs> yeah I, I've never been to BCLT I, I mean I, I, I did make an application once and, and I did uh, a few years back and I got some very helpful be feedback from Mar mm. Margaret Yule Costa who's <laughs> translated San Margo yeah. and a lovely lovely wonderful lady and um, I, I translated a, a snippet from Sophia de Mello Brown and Anderson, which was um, from a, one of her contosh. And, uh, you know, she, she pointed out several things were, were, which I hadn't seen at the time for myself were, were, were problematical and was very helpful. And, but the translation which I did, I kept it. And I was able to use it for that same translation because it had to be up to 3,000 words for my application to um, the visual communities. Um, <laughs> presentation. Obviously, I had to edit it and edit it and edit it down to a, a really high standard of translation. So, of course, since I didn't have to produce the Portuguese original, it, it, there was no problem having to concentrate on reconcentrate on translating. So I just edited the English translation alongside some of the um, editorial notes which um, uh, um, Margaret Yule Costa had kindly provided. She only did about, I'd say, about the first page of my translation because it was a short story of about seven or eight or nine pages. So, yeah, so it did come in handy. So yeah. I think I've learned in my life, Rebecca, that anything to do with professional work, whether it be a job you don't like or whether it be a job you do like, 
you can learn something from everything that you do. And and as you said, Rebecca, teaching is a wonderful way of communicating, and it's an an, an alternative way of communicating communicating to translation mm. but even now as, as we speak as you know Rebecca things are merging and you have the shadow heroes uh, yeah. uh, program going on and so so I'm going to try and keep my hand in it in as much as I can I have the pleasure Re- Rebecca uh, and the, the good fortune to have retired now so I I retired but I, I said to myself I'm not going to just vegetate I'm, I'm going to be <laughs> do what I really really love doing which is literary translation and uh, so, yeah, so that, that's, that's partly my story, Rebecca. But uh, well, I was going to ask, and um, it's interesting that you said it, because I was going to ask about your working life and how, like, maybe, so, yeah. yeah, basically how translation currently fits into your life and how maybe that's different on a residency, just for people. It's yeah. your first residency as well? Yes, like, it is my first, yeah. Yeah. So is, yeah. That, is, it, is your working on a translation and the, the way you think about your work and the way you structure your day, is that different to your day-to-day life? And in what way is it beneficial yeah. being in a residency? Well, well, it's very beneficial being in a residency because I can focus purely on translation and on my notes my local environment and inspirational things which come about like just going to bookshops and reading and things like that and you know looking the millennium library in Norwich is wonderful (laughs) absolutely wonderful um although I must admit I didn't spend my time read looking at Portuguese literature there I was looking at a a teach yourself Hindi book because I'm very (laughs) very very interested in that although I'm an Indian by birth not by birth but by um by race I kind of um, wanted to read the alphabet and uh, and there was a mm-hmm. wonderful book there which I read which it sh- you know I could l- read the English above the the, uh, the Hindi script and decipher the letters from that and that was better than any teach yourself book I think that, that mm-hmm. I'd read previously so I may pop into that library again to to say to at least to know how to read to write in Hindi hello and this is my name and things like that so very basic stuff but no so yeah to get back to the question um, Rebecca, it's translation and my working life. Being in the cottage has enabled me to focus on Madrigada Free and purely that as translation and have no distractions. When I retired, Rebecca, I had so many plans. I wanted to focus just on literary translation and just translating and and, and nothing else. But life intervenes, as you know, um, Rebecca, and my mother had a severe fall and fractured her hip in October. So I've been caring for her ever since last year, October. And this residency was something I'd been planning and I told her about. Um, and she said, yes, Derek, go for it. You know, but she's, I arranged for her to go into a care home because the last, the previous seven months, I'd just been sleeping on the sofa and it, I brought her bed downstairs to, to the living room because she couldn't extend the stairs at that mm-hmm. stage. But uh, mum has been so brave and, you know, and uh, inspirational to me and, and always, always, always wanted me to, to do what I want to do in my career. So so really, this has been my first escape to focus on Madrigada Freya. <laughs> Having said that, Rebecca, in all the time while I was right, still working as, as a, for a charity, as a, a part-time as a fundraiser, which is my last job before, before I retired, I, I, I had done a draft of most of the, quite a number of the poems in Madrigada Freya. So... Mm. It's not something which is just sat on suddenly starting. It's, it's kind of like, as you mentioned, it, Rebecca, you, you have sometimes when you read something, you have a dream of wanting to translate it almost straight away. And uh, so, so it's something I have been focusing on much more now since I've been in the cottage, Joe. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing I, I like about um, the residency is that. Kate has said to me, Derek, you don't need to translate the whole book in one go because it's a, it's about approximately 90 to 100 pages of poems. Mm. So, so it does present that challenge because, uh, and Howard also, Howard and Mina herself as well, both advised me, um, Rebecca, not to just con- concentrate. I felt a, be- a good idea would be to focus on a niche part of translation, such as poetry. But Howard said to me, and so did Mina, Derek, don't just confine yourself to fit prose because prose, um, sorry, to poetry, because Poetry is less well published, as you know, that, than fiction. So mm-hmm. try and keep your fiction writing up. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that Amelia will get me that book and I can translate <laughs> it. And uh, I know it won't be an easy book to translate because I've read 
she used to be a journalist as well, a journalist in, in, in Portugal mm-hmm. after she left the teaching. And um, she, her, her language is, uh, I wouldn't say flowery, but um, has, has certain words in it which are unusual in terms of um, possibly ex- exoticity rather than anything else. But um, It's really interesting and, and thanks for talking about this as well because I think I find that like um, sometimes we have this idea that like, you know, in order to become a literary translator, you just have to find the right book, you like translate it and it becomes a bestseller and that's it. But there's so many stages where life intervenes and I think it's got to do with with sort of a lot of translators being freelance of course like a lot of translators having either another job alongside it or having a previous other job and then like kind of not do, doing it full-time that like for a lot of people I feel like it always comes in second because like there's always more important things to do and like because it's kind of like sometimes almost like a glorified hobby and one day you maybe get into it as well so I think it's it's really helpful for people to hear that like you've you've made a plan you've really kind of focused on you know getting into literary translation and then life happens um and these kind of things um i was wondering whether you also maybe want to talk about a little bit um about the visible communities residency itself is also structured for um enabling people who have less access to the literary translation profession because of backgrounds and because of um obstacles and hurdles and um discrimination on different grounds um, whether you would like to talk about that a bit in terms of like, I think you mentioned like there's a sort of like glass ceiling that is there for black and brown translators to break through. Um, and I was wondering where you, in your own experience, where you see that and where you think like black and brown translators are like even more disadvantaged in this whole like gig economy of literary translation of like doing it along the well, side. Well, I think the very the very fact, Rebecca, that there is something such as a visible communities res- translation residency shows that the translation world has recognised that there, that there is a, a possible difficulty for would-be translators f- from black and brown communities. I mean, I, I would say, um, I wouldn't say as such that it's a glass ceiling because it, 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 it's, it's, more, it's more something where I've not really had or seen from a long time um, role models for me. Now that's of course has been changing rapidly within the last five years. As you know, Rahul Berry was made uh, resident translator at the British Library, and before I met Rahul, I, I, I just would not have known how to get into it. So it's a lack of knowledge, really, also ra- rather than an actual physical barrier in terms of you know because of colour or, or etc. And you know it, it, it's. Um, I, I cannot claim Rebecca to be to have to come from a background which is um, where a, a background where I wasn't educated. So mm-hmm. I've had the privilege of a good education, um, although I had to fight hard to get it. And and uh, and my, my my parents were always keen that I get a good education, as a lot of um, immigrant parents are when they first come to a new country. And um, Fight hard. When I say fight hard, I, I had to. I got a scholarship to school so that my father could pay the fees. Secondary school. This is um, sorry, middle school and then secondary school. And um, I've always been the sort of, the sort of person who has looked up. To, to, my father was a self-made man. He he came to this country with that, a penny in his pocket on a scholarship from India to to practice in a bank, train as a bank clerk. And he worked his way up and he eventually joined a, a Thai bank, in fact, and, and became vice president. But he, because he was a self-made man, he always inculcated in us, um, Rebecca, the, the idea that we must not rely on anybody to, for, for, for um, improving ourselves, if you like. So, I mean, that, that goes for myself, things outside of professional work, for example, I mentioned to Kate yesterday at her evening meal um, that uh, um, I learned to play cricket from reading a book by Sir Donald Bradman. And uh, <laughs> I, nobody taught me, nobody coached me. I just learned. And the same goes for translation, actually, um, Rebecca. I, when I sat at the Diploma in Translator for, for the Institute of Linguists, I read a book by um, Peter Newmark called Principles of Translation, Took it in, and although obviously it was based upon his his um, translations, which are um, 
obviously French and I think possibly German. I think also he did German. But anyway, the uh, the book, which is lost somewhere in my house of books or little library, uh, the the book uh, encouraged me so much that I passed the diploma in translation exam and uh, got two merits and a distinction. So. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it spurred me on. Uh, and I was always, always that, that was way back in 1993, 1994. So that was something which I thought, so always at the back of my mind was, I'm going to be a translator one day and I want to get this qualification and I want to test myself under pressure. So the exam, the exams are quite pressurized, the Department of Translation exams, even in those days. And, and in those days, you had to write your, your script. You didn't couldn't type it on a computer. So, yeah, so it was, you know, it probably, uh, the examiners probably hated my doctor's scroll of writing, but somehow they, they deciphered it. So... You know, maybe it wasn't that bad. <laughs> um, you mentioned before as well that, like, you feel like there's no kind of waste of time. Like, there's no kind of, um, you know, you can take on all the information and that, that will yeah. always help you. Yeah. Um, there's never, like, a waste to, like, learn new things and learn new things. Yes. I was wondering whether you've got any advice for other emerging translators who maybe are, you know, thinking of a career in literary translation or thinking of a second career in literary translation or kind of what, what would you, what should they take on board and what should well, they do? Well, as you know, nowadays, Rebecca, a lot of young translators um, are able to attend courses and do MAs and go on to do PhDs in translation. So, And it's a, something which I've been finding with uh, the last two generations, I think, of young people have been, have had to be so focused in what they want to study and what they want to do after they study that almost, they're almost geared up to be vocational at a much younger age than I was. Um, mm. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, e- even while I was at university, I think, I, I studied languages at university because I liked them, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had this vague idea I wanted to be like my dad and be a banker, but, of course, that was just not me. And although I worked for Barclays Bank for five years um, and left after the apartheid system was um, expelled them kind of from, from from South Africa. So they were, you know, I was pleased about that. But And I thought, well, I, I didn't have that much to do with it, but, uh, you know, it was something which I felt, you know, job done and I need to move on now and I need to get in, into another career. And, of course, then we were moving to Portugal. After I left Barclays, we, we, we were moving to Portugal anyway. So, yeah. yeah. But um, it's, so my advice would be, uh, I've written some notes here, I would say to young translators, network, network and network. You never know who you'll meet who's going, who's going to lead you to things. Mm-hmm. It was purely by chance, a chance meeting, Rebecca, with Rahul Berry at the British Library mm-hmm. for an International Translation Day. Uh, that I, I, I asked him what he did. He said he's a literary translator. And he said, and I said, how did you get into it, Rahul? And he said, well, Derek, there's something you must, must do, which is join the Emerging Translators Network. So, so this was going probably going back about three or four or five, maybe even five years, Rebecca. So, mm. so I, I've been on there and, you know, it, it, as you know, Rebecca, it's a wealth of information and, and people are so supportive. And, um, and this is what I like about the translation community as well, Rebecca. It's, you know, it's not closed. I and mean, some people say writers are solitary beings, but translators are not solitary beings because they like mm. to discuss with other translators, <laughs> You know how 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 they approach translation. You know how how they would approach certain conundrums in translation, as as you mentioned, and Absolutely. and things like that. But so I, I mentioned that, and I would say also, as I mentioned earlier, tra- um, Rebecca, try and keep learning, 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 and challenging your own translation comfort zone. So, for example, if you're the sort of person who's come into literary translation from commercial translation, like legal translation or whatever, don't just say that to yourself. Say, I'm also going to read sports journals, or I'm also going to read journals about house and home, or journals about Mm -hmm. um, the economy, or anything and everything to broaden your outlook. Because Mm -hmm. when it all comes down to it, it's, it's all part of a language and a language, the more you know about a language and you know, the more you know about lang- language concepts, the more you can apply that to um, to your work. Um, I don't think I'm at the stage where I could be a mentor for anybody just yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we one day that my experience will, will come to, to that stage where I can pass that on. But mm. um, and, and going back earlier to what we were saying about glass ceilings and Rebecca, 
as I said, things are changing rapidly and, 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 and the translation profession recognises that. And I would say it may be, sometimes be the case, Rebecca, that um, parents of, of second-generation children who come here who are immigrants who, who are probably expert at their language and the, the English language as well, they tend to want, sometimes they would tend to want to go the standard route and go, you know, into banking or law or medicine or something like that, which which, which possibly pays a lot more. And, that, you know, that, you know, that they need to, they want to, be, they want to do better for their parents and they want to help their pa- parents with, um, you know, with, um, w- w- with their, with their um, circumstances because the parents have put so much in for them. Mm. I don't know if you found that yourself, Rebecca, with, with your mm. parents want, wanting wanting mm. you to, you know, kind of uh, do what you wanted to do, and at the same mm. time put, put to good use the the marvelous education which I'm sure they gave you. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it's interesting you asking me that question because I'm because uh, uh, I moved here from Germany about eleven years ago, um, and my mother's a single mother, um, so like obviously, but but I went to like a semi private school because she tried really hard to like give me the good education and I think when I was doing my course this year I was doing a, an undergraduate and a master's and um, he always saw it as like you know another way of like educating yourself another way of like bettering yourself and I think that is something that maybe you um, like yeah you kind of bring with you that you feel like you well you want to do your parents proud of course but you also kind of you yeah you feel like there's there's a little bit of a duty maybe as well that you want to like not do something frivolous and waste away your time you do want to do something like good and practical and I think sometimes maybe that's a bit hard to like break out of especially for literary translation for example where because it's so closely related to the arts and I think that's still seen as something that's like and maybe in COVID times as well where people are thinking well what use do I bring to society as a literary translator as an artist I think some people are really grappling with that but I, I mean, I feel like now is the time for us to come to the fore of like, well, I think so too. recovering. Definitely. This is when we need the arts. <laughs> Def- definitely. Of course, Rebecca, more than ever before. I mean, uh, we, we need to we need to have um, a cu- cultural entertainment, not just because our, po- artists are poor and poorly paid and everything. It's because they bring so much joy and enrich society. I mean, it. Going back to classical Greek, which, if it, which I may mention, um, Rebecca, um, Athens was well known as a, a city for a thriving art scene, and obviously in terms of tragedy, comedy, etc. And uh, I think people like William Gregory, who, who's on yeah. frequently on, on um, yeah. um, the ETN, and and, and su- marvelous suggestions for plays, etc. I mean, I. I have seen um, plays by Spanish directors, plays by Portuguese directors, out of the wings theatre, and mm. you know, it's a, you know, it. I, I would love to one day translate a play, but possibly not a Portuguese play. Possibly, <laughs> I have a friend who's doing a p- reading for a PhD in classics at, at King's College, and um, he is also was a great translator, but he went into journalism and. Um, always felt that he should have done a classics degree. And um, I said to him, Alex, it's never too late. So in his, I think in his 60th year, he, he's, he's a year older than me, although we were in the same year at school. In his 60th year, he, he sorry, in his 58th year, he started a, a BA course in classics at Birkbeck <laughs> University, Amazing. went on to do an MA, and he's now studying for a PhD in classics. And my dream yeah. is, Rebecca, to one day produce a production of a play which we both enjoyed at A-level at, at, at school, Off the Back Eye by Euripides. And, uh, you know, so it's a dream. I have to see if I can get other other of my pupils, who, of my fellow students who are in school at that time. But um, Alex, I've kept in touch with, and we just, you know, I keep in touch with um, developments in, in, in the classics. I mean, there's, uh, there's very recently, Rebecca, uh, if I might diverge from Portuguese for a little while, uh, there's okay. very recently been a, um, a, a new updated version of the Greek to English, classical Greek to English lexicon um, by Cambridge University. And it's, yeah. um, it's uh, very, very, very modern and focused. And some, some of the old dictionaries which I used were so stuffy and, you know, kind of very, <laughs> um, 
archaic language, etc., which, you know, it forced that upon us in our translations at O level and A level. So I'm very pleased that Cambridge has gone down, gone down that route and um, developed a dictionary which is applicable to real life rather than um, uh, kind of, oh, the, the, the Greeks are tremendous heroes and, you know, all, all this yeah. and all that. And, 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 and there is another side to them, of course, and, and there's... Mm you know, as there is to any, any people's, but uh, no, but as, going back again, uh, Rebecca, the arts and the culture are in times of crisis are more important than ever. Uh, and to, to have more funding is critical, absolutely critical. If if not for just for the economy, if, for the sake of so many people who are going to lose their livelihoods, you know, it's yeah. very, very important, Rebecca, very, very important. And I fully agree with you as well, Rebecca, we, Having one parent um, who wanted you to do really, really well, that happened to me later in life because dad died in 2010. And in many ways, mum and I balance each other out in that I, I'm helping her with her daily needs, etc. And uh, and she's motivating me with, with, with my translation. Um, when, when dad was alive, maybe... Um, because he was such a powerful personality, I was living a bit in his shadow. But I do know also that he also was the one who encouraged me to, to study Portuguese. He was the one who funded me even to study Portuguese. And, you know, so I'm grateful to both my parents. And, and, and uh, you know, for the last 11 years, it's just been mum and me. But, you know, as you said, you know, you want to do it for, for your, to make your parents proud or your parent proud and you also want to do it for yourself and to better yourself mm. and and this you know it's a, it's a generational thing i think isn't it it is mm. you know yeah. it, it's part of the human condition the evolution and everything mm. so yeah but yeah it's really it also reminds me of a goethe quote where um he says good parents give give their children roots and wings so the yes. grounding, but also kind of definitely go and, and, and blossom and flourish in their own in their own way i was gonna have i've got a final question but you've you've already talked about plans and stuff already of like um staging plays but i was thinking yeah what what are your plans for the immediate future and what is going to happen to madrigal rafia yeah the, the immediate plan is for, for uh, mina has um said she will give me another zoom session in three months time so the immediate plan is she wants me to translate at least 10 poems, sample poems, and get them up to a publication standard. And she also wants me to prepare a biography of Flora, Laura de Silva, mm -hmm. which will be helpful in pitching. Mm -hmm. and, and also she would like me to somehow meet Laura virtually mm -hmm. and discuss with her whether, whether it, it is viable that we, you know, I, I translate her stuff and whether whether she's happy for me to do that. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I'd like to meet her in person. I've already spoken to the publisher, her publisher and the, the publishing director. But as you know, with publishing that, you know, you send them an email the same day and everything, expect to get something back and nothing happens. Nothing has happened since April now. I sent two emails, second one with the read receipt and didn't hear anything back. So probably I have to contact her again, which I'm happy to do. Mm -hmm. um, she, the publishing director said, oh, yes, 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 we can meet on WhatsApp and everything, but nothing, nothing transpired. It could be that Laura was working on other projects. It could be that the publishing director was so busy with other other more important um, prose works. So that I'm focusing on that now, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. At the same time, trying to, uh, as Howard and both Mina and Howard said, trying to keep my finger in other translations as well, other mm -hmm. pies and... And, of course, still looking at my Latin and Greek as well. So, <laughs> Of course, the other thing, as you know, Rebecca, is that at this time of year is very close to the Stephen Spender Prize for mm. Poetry and Translation, which I enter yeah. religiously every year, sometimes with Latin <laughs> and Greek, more, more recently, more with Portuguese. Mm. So, yeah, that, that, that I always think is, is a motivational factor for brushing up on translations and, and preparing samples and... Yeah, you know, so it's it is it's good practice. So, yeah, so that's the immediate future. Okay. I'm not going to look too far ahead because I've learned sometimes that to take one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. But I have I t this year. I haven't done it because so much has happened this year. And but I, I at the beginning of the year, Rebecca, I make myself a program of things that I want to do. And even before I'd left the civil service, even before I'd left the charity where I worked for, 
all of the all I've looked at past past programs which I've drawn up at the beginning of each year. All of them mention about improve my Portuguese, improve my Spanish, improve mm -hmm. my French, read more <laughs> Spanish, read more French, translate more Spanish, translate more French, translate more Portuguese. And all of them are all language related, but um, in the sense that they've had to be supplemented by working and mm -hmm. having a day job. So, but always, always at the back of my mind, there's that thing, focus on this, Derek, and do this. Mm -hmm. I've not always achieved all of my goal, partly through life intervening, as I said, um, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, retirement is a time for reflection, but also a time for new challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, Sarah, you know Sarah Bauer, don't you, Rebecca? Sarah is a wonderful example of somebody who just keeps going and going and going mm -hmm. and is involved with the translation world in, world in, the commer in its commercial aspect, really... It, the commercial aspect is something which I'm hoping to learn more from, from Mina, and I've already started learning rapidly from her. So, mm. uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful world to be in the translation world, as you know, Rebecca, and, <laughs> and there's so, so much to be done and so much that can be done, and one has mm. to focus at some time on specific things. But, um, no, it, it's, it's a great world to, to be in, and I'm so glad that Rahul mentioned to me about ETN because if I hadn't, joined ETN, I would never have seen about the visible communities. That, that's, that's maybe another thing which I, I would mention, Rebecca, for, for minorities. It, um, ETN is not well publicised enough, obviously being a voluntary thing, not well publicised enough for black and ethnic minority people to, to know about it because that they would, they just would not be looking for those kind of websites. And, you know, so, yeah, that's, a po that's another possible um, not not um, so much a glass ceiling, but it's another possible reason why people don't um, go go into the literary translation field. So. But I would always encourage anybody who, who, who has the talent to do it, I, I would encourage them as much as I can. I try to encourage my niece who studied Spanish at, at the same uni as me, but she said, I don't want to do it, Derek. It doesn't pay. <laughs> and she knows, what, <laughs> she knows what she wants, so fair enough to her. But, you know, she's a... She still, she still asks me occasionally for translations of um, Spanish words which are similar to Galician or Portuguese, <laughs> and, I, and I'm able to help her. But uh, no, yeah. very focused. As, as I was saying, with most young people, you know, money is is an important factor, in mm -hmm. particular in these days in which young people are, have so few opportunities, you know, to to to, uh, to start embark upon a career which is going to be mm. fruitful for them and, and and also enable them to pay off their student loan. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. But also things like birth, things which are coming up now, like birth, bursaries and, mm. you know, translation opportunities funded by people such as Daniel, you know, they mm. they are really, really important for, for young people who just would not have the opportunity otherwise. So... That's very important. Yeah, thanks for summarizing some of some of the opportunities because it's not it's not yeah. quite as dire as we maybe painted at yeah. some point as well. Yeah. Um, but Derek, thank you so much. This has been really inspirational, I think. In oh, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Thank you, thank you so thank much, you. Rebecca. All the best. Thank you. Thanks for listening, and thanks to Derek and Rebecca for that fantastic conversation. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Writers Centre. We're on Facebook and you can visit nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk to find out more about the East Anglian Book Awards, Creative Writing Online courses and all of our other programmes and events. It's a lot of stuff. Lots and lots of stuff going on. Exactly. And as a UK registered charity, we do rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. If you'd like to make a donation, you can do so by heading over to the website and clicking on the Support Us page. Thanks again. Keep writing and we'll catch you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.